and welcome to our online service of worship again for this Sunday. It's really great to be able to gather together, although it would be much better to see you in person, this is still good and uh, we are thankful for the opportunity to be able to gather online and still journey together in thought and in prayer. This Sunday we uh, begin into our Lenten season and over the next few weeks as part of our uh, Lent worship, we are going to take some time to look at some spiritual disciplines. Hopefully many of you will have received our Lent devotional book, uh, Journey with God. If you haven't received one of these and you would like to journey with us, you can download a copy and there will be a link uh, on your church's social media pages or on the Glenburn Methodist uh, website. As we journey through Lent, we want to take time to very intentionally think on the disciplines that invite us into a deeper sense of who God is. Lent provides us with an opportunity for repentance and self-examination. And some of these tools and disciplines can help us along in that journey. And so this morning, we begin by thinking on scripture and thinking about how the study of scripture enhances our relationship with God and equips us to live out God in the world. So as we come to today's worship, we still our hearts for just a moment. We silence the distractions that's going on around us. And we ask God to come and to speak. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. So Lord God, will you light up our paths as we look to your word? May we hear you speak and may our hearts be enriched and revived because of it. Amen. Let us worship.
Let us pray. Wonderful, gracious, almighty and sovereign God, we gather here online today to worship you. Help us, Lord, to hear beyond the noise of the world that surrounds us. Help us to recognise your voice, to listen to what you might have to say to us and to hold your word in our hearts. We draw near to you today, gracious God, laying aside the things that hinder us, focusing on you and your will for us. And we pray that you open our minds and our hearts to you. Forgive us, God of grace, when we have listened to other voices instead of yours and drawn away from you. Forgive us, God of love, when we have refused to give up our bitterness, our selfishness and all the stuff that we should just not keep inside. Forgive us, God of salvation, when we have forgotten who you are and what you have done for us and who you call us to be. Forgive us, God of justice, when we have treated others badly or neglected their needs, when we, when we have closed our eyes to suffering, not acting in your mercy, but in our own impatience or busyness. Forgive us, God. Cleanse our hearts, we pray. Forgive our guilt and instruct us in the days ahead as we begin this journey through Lent. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the Son of God. We thank you that you did not shrink back from who you were meant to be, nor take a different path following deceptive voices. Will you help us and guide us to follow you as our Redeemer, our Teacher, and supreme example of what it means for us to be human? Guide us in these days, Lord our God. Renew and refresh us in these days, we pray. And we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. How are you all today? I hope you've had a great week and that you've been able to have a fun weekend. So this morning, this is the first Sunday in Lent. So Lent started during the week, which of course meant that we had Pancake Tuesday. Did anybody have any really nice pancakes? I made some pancakes for my family. And Andre, he decided that he would put mallows and Nutella on top of his pancakes and it was all melty and all really nice and he thought they were really lovely. Did anybody else make anything really different? If you did, send us some pictures and you can put them in the comments in either YouTube or Facebook. We'd love to see what pancakes that you made. So over Lent, Lent is a time coming up to Easter and it's time that we take to wait and prepare ourselves. And during Lent, often people stop doing something. They give something up. Maybe you have stopped eating chocolate or maybe you're not playing games on your phone or on your iPad or something different. But this year, we are looking at the spiritual disciplines over Lent. Now that might sound really hard, but it's actually not. The spiritual disciplines are things that help us come closer to God. And so this morning, Ken is going to be talking to us later on about the Bible 
and scripture and how that can help us come closer to God. So just now I want to talk to you so that we can talk about what the Bible is. So the Bible is the book that God gave us and I'm sure you all have one in your house. I have mine here. I have lots of different Bibles but this is one of my favourite ones that I use. It's the New International Version. So in here we read lots of stories about Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I love Lego. So I have a Lego here that I was given for Christmas and I haven't been able to do yet. So we're going to look a little bit at my Lego this morning. So here is my Lego and I've opened it up and inside there's these two bags full of bricks and there's lots of different sizes and shapes and colours. Over here with some of them opened out there's this one and then there's this funny shaped one here and then there's this nice blue one it's a nice colour over here that there's a door okay and a head now I don't know where to start with all of these bricks it's supposed to look like this picture and I don't know where to start to put all these bricks together to make it look like that it's just as well that in the box they send this. They send instructions to help me to put it all together. So if we open it up, we can see that it gives you instructions with all the different pieces of Lego that you need and where they have to go to start building it up. So that it will start to look like this picture. So without this booklet, this booklet of instructions of which brick has to go where, I wouldn't have a clue how to start putting this all together. So you might wonder why I'm talking to you about my Lego when I told you that I was going to talk to you about the Bible. Well, what was the one thing that came with the Lego that made it so much easier and fun? It was the instructions. If I didn't have the instructions for my Lego, I wouldn't know where to start. I wouldn't know which brick had to go with which brick and it would have been no fun at all. But with the instructions, I can follow them and it helps me put it together. And the Bible is a little bit like that for us. The Bible is full of stories about Jesus. Stories where he tells us how we should live. He tells us that we should love one another, that we should help one another, that we should be kind and generous. But there's also other parts in the Bible where there's directions. We read in the Old Testament about Moses, who got the Ten Commandments, which we are supposed to follow. So there's lots of different things in the Bible that helps us to live our life. It's instructions and directions that help us make choices and make decisions. So when we read the Bible, we get to know Jesus more and we can come closer to God. So we should try and read the Bible as often as we can so that we can know Jesus and that we can become closer to God. So let's take a moment to pray. We thank you, Lord, for your special directions for our lives. Help us to read the Bible often so we know how to make good choices. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is taken from Psalm 
16. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their name on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. You're hidden. Jesus, you brought him. 
A reading from Acts chapter 17, verses 1 to 11. After Paul and Silas had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days argued with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This is the Messiah, Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews became jealous, and with the help of some ruffians in the marketplaces, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. While they were searching for Paul and Silas to bring them out to the assembly, they attacked Jason's house. When they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some believers before the city authorities, shouting, These people who have been turning the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has entertained them as guests. They're all acting contrary to the decrees of the emperor, saying that there is another king named Jesus. The people and the city officials were disturbed when they heard this. And after they had taken bail from Jason and the others, they let them go. That very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas off to Berea, and when they arrived, they went to the Jewish synagogue. These Jews were more receptive than those in Thessalonica, for they welcomed the message very eagerly and examined the scriptures every day to see whether these things were so. Amen. Good morning and thank you for joining with us in our online worship this morning. As Cheryl said, this is the first week when we start to look at some of the spiritual disciplines through the period of Lent. This week we're thinking about scriptures and the study of scriptures and I'd like to take and explore a wee bit more what we'll be looking at on Thursday in your Lenten book for Thursday the 25th and especially it's this verse is the key. Now the Berians were more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. I was reminded during the week of a story of a lady who went to a busy shopping centre. As you can imagine, it was difficult to find a parking space, so she zigzagged up and down the rows until she seen someone coming back or heading back towards the car with their parcels. So she headed over and waited patiently to the man loaded the bit of his car and then reverse out. But just as she was putting it into gear, a young man in a shiny sports car just zipped past her, around her and pulled into the empty space. He got out and casually walked away. Hey, shouted the woman who was driving a Mercedes. I've been waiting for that parking space. The young man just looked at her and replied as he walked away. He says, sorry, lady, that's how it is when you're young and quick. She paused for a moment. Then she put her Mercedes into gear, put her foot to the floor and crashed into the right rear bumper of the car, crushing it and the rear quarter panel. The gilm fella shouted at her, hey, you can't do that. The lady who had just crashed into the sports car turned right and said, that's how it is when you're old and rich. As I thought about that story, I realised again that maturity does not necessarily come with age. You can be young and foolish and you can be just as easily be old and foolish. Just when I think that maturity comes with age or that you learn to be less foolish with time, I get to the end of another day and want to kick myself for some foolish thing I have said or done. Age does not equal maturity. Maturity comes in another way. In the story that Cheryl read to us earlier in the scriptures, the Berians were a group of folk who manifested spiritual maturity. They possessed character that was marked by excellence. Paul described them as noble. They were engaged in a spiritual quest 
an adventure, a search for spiritual truth. They were open-minded, unlike the other groups that Paul had tried to reach. Instead of opposing him, they eagerly heard him. They searched the scriptures to see if what he was saying was true. And the truth they discovered transformed them. Perhaps you know of someone who have been on a quest, but they never seem to really find what they're looking for. In fact, maybe you begin to wonder, do they really want to find the truth? I have known people who are searching spiritually, but who believe it is impossible to really know spiritual realities. Paul spoke of those who were always learning, but never able to acknowledge the truth. If you are not willing to find the truth, then your quest is not a noble one. Well, the question then is, what makes a noble quest? Well, let's look at the example of the Berians here in this passage. Well, the first thing that is necessary for a quest to be noble is when we receive the good news with eagerness. The people from Thessalonica had opposed the message that Paul brought them. In fact, they followed him from place to place, stirring up trouble. It was not that the Thessalonians did not have the opportunity, for the scripture says, As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue and on a three Sabbath day, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. And some of them did believe and receive the message. But the reality was the majority opposed him. And not just a little. They stirred up a mob and hired them to spread lies. They refused to listen to anything he had to say. They closed their minds and their hearts. Paul had patiently explained the truth to them over a period of time. He reasoned with them and explained to them the good news. And it was not just empty talk. He proved what he had to say about Christ from the scriptures. But it was to no avail. Their hearts were hardened to the message of Paul, even though it was great, wonderful good news. I think the reality is that there are those who are eager to hear the good news and those who are eager to hear bad news. There are those who are glad to hear a word of faith and hope and those who are glad to hear a word of scepticism and doubt. There are those who delight in the truth and those who delight in the lie. You see, to be a person of nobility on a genuine quest, you have to be at least open-minded. You have to receive the message, which is good news, to receive it with anticipation and eagerness. This means that you will eventually go on to retain the seed that has been sown and ultimately produce a crop of righteousness. You will be able to recognise when something has the ring of truth. And you want to know more about it. This cultivates spiritual hunger and it's important. For a noble person is eager to receive that all that God has for them. Even if it means that they have to move outside their own personal comfort zone. In the culture in which we live today, we are taught to be sceptical and to nurse our doubts. But at some point we have to be open to faith and the spiritual realities of life. But how do we keep them from making a serious mistake? How do you know when something is genuine or sounds good? Well, this leads us to the second point. If the first point is that it's necessary to be an open hearted and to hear the good news with eagerness. Then the second point is a quest becomes noble when we examine the scriptures to see if it is true. Never ever be afraid to investigate the Bible. It can stand up to the toughest test of intellectual scrutiny. We don't want to be gullible and just eagerly accept anything that comes down the spiritual pike because it sounds good. 
We want to discover whether or not it is true. And this is what made the Berians noble. The Bible says this, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. I am amazed by those who are always in a quest, but never arrive anywhere, always searching but never finding, seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not understand. Truth, by its very nature, is specific. I'm reminded of the quote from the play, the musical of Hamilton, where Hamilton says to Aaron Burr, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. You see, the reality is we have to land somewhere. And when you hear something that sounds good, then we had better check it out with the scriptures to see if it is true. Now, it may be the latest spiritual chic which everyone is trying, but if it's not based in reality, what good does it do? You see, God has given us his word, a reliable document called the Bible, by which we can measure and assess what is true and what is not. If we did not have the Bible, there would be no way to judge what is true and what is not except through our own intuition. In the Lent Reflection books, we are encouraging ourselves through this journey of Lent to engage more with different spiritual disciplines. And today we're thinking about engaging with the scriptures. And my challenge is this, don't just casually pick up the Bible and read a verse here and there. Become a student of the word. Jesus said to those who believe him, if you hold my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you three. That's from John chapter 8 verses 31 and 32. But in those two verses, we learn four important things from this statement. One, there is such a thing as truth. The second, truth is knowledgeable. The third, the way to know truth is to study Jesus' teachings. And the fourth is the truth is freeing. Perhaps in your thinking or in your experience, you may have had trouble with the church or maybe question the actions of Christians and churches in history. But we have to be beyond that and study the person of Jesus. Study his ministry, study his teachings and his life. It is in this that we will find the truth and it is the truth by which all other truths are measured and evaluated. The Berians received Paul's message eagerly, but they still checked it out. They still examined it to see if it was true. That is the same thing that we should do whenever we hear anyone proclaiming what they say is the truth of God. Don't just take my word for it. Something that is true can stand the test of investigation. Don't just go in your feelings. Study the word and see if it is there. That is part of the necessary task in the quest to be noble. The third thing that makes the quest noble is when, after we have studied the word and we have examined the word, that we are far transformed by the truth we find in it. I know a lot of people who believe in all the right things. If you investigate their beliefs, it will be difficult to find anything with which you would disagree. But they have never let the truth they believe in transform them. You need to understand that truth is not static. If truth has not transformed your life, then it has not done its work. What's the point in believing of the truth if it doesn't change you? Romans 12 and 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Our minds, our wills and our attitudes all must go through this transformation process. The biblical word for this is sanctification. Sanctification is God's work in us through his word and through the Holy Spirit to transform us into the image of Christ. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. We read that in 2 Peter. If the Bible's information does not lead to transformation, then it lacks application. When there is no application of the truth, then we believe a lie. A noble quest prepares us for times of crisis as well. But you have to be willing to receive the truth, investigate the truth and be transformed by the truth. I'll leave you again with a reading from 1 John chapter 3. Dear friends, we are now the children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Because we have studied his word, we have let it transform us and we know who our saviour is. Amen. This morning in our prayers of intercession, we're going to follow the words of Psalm 23 and use them to help us in our prayers for others. The Lord is my shepherd. Father, we give thanks that we are in relationship with you, that you're our God, our Father in heaven. Father, we thank you for the relationships we have here on earth, for our families, for our friends, for those that we care for deeply. Father, help us to keep good relationships, especially at this time. Father, we pray that we would have good communication and look out for those that we love. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Father, we pray that you would help us to find rest. I know many people feel weary and tired at the moment because of all that is going on around us. But Father, we pray that we would find our true rest in you. He leads me beside quiet waters. As we seek rest, may we also find refreshment in you. Father, may we know your love and your spirit within us. May we find your strength once more. May everything we do be done in your strength. For he restores my soul. Father, may we know your healing. And we take a moment now just to think of those that we know who just aren't feeling so well at the moment. 
Maybe some are in hospital. At home. Or maybe in a residential home. Father, we pray for your healing of body, mind and spirit. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Father, we thank you for your protection around us. With the fear of COVID, and all of those things that are on our mind at the moment. We give thanks for doctors and nurses who give so much of themselves in their job. We give thanks too that a vaccine has been found. And as that is rolled out across the country, Father, we just pray that we would find protection in that. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Father, through all, we know that we have hope in you. In these storms that are rolling around us, may we never forget that in the storm you sent the rainbow, that sign that gives us hope. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Father, we are grateful for all that you have provided for us. And Father, we pray for those who maybe are suffering at the moment. We think of the homeless, those who don't have somewhere to call home, especially at the minute when the weather is so cold. We pray for those who call the streets their home. And Father, we think of all those organisations that try to help, to provide sustenance, provide some kind of warmth and comfort. We pray too for the many food banks who are providing meals at the moment, particularly as children are off school as they're doing school from home and more meals need to be provided. Father, we give thanks for those food banks and all who help through them. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Father, we thank you for the blessing that it is to be known as your child. May your love and your grace be ever present around us. And may I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.
for joining with us this morning as we have worshipped together and as we have thought on the word of God. We pray that you have sensed to God's spirit stir within you. And we pray that as the week goes on, that that stirring of the spirit will increase as you get to know God more by the reading of his word. Please know the invitation uh, for Wednesday evening to join us for the joint Bible studies, uh, which will be on Zoom. You are very welcome to come and to join us. Uh, the information will be posted just at the very end of the service, but you'll also find it on uh, our social media pages. So you know the link to join in with the Zoom. Uh, we're gonna be looking at different characters at the cross and thinking through what it is we might learn from those characters and in their journey and encounter with Jesus. And that'll be led by the various ministers from the Methodist churches in East Belfast. So do please join us on Wednesday evening at half past seven. We would absolutely love to see you there. So until next Sunday, stay safe, keep well, and enjoy the journey as we carry on through Lent. Let's bless one another now with the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.